Al Rabin from the Allegrand Foundation, and she'll be speaking on proof of work and proof of stake. Thank you. So it turns out that we were all waiting for nothing because they had thought that the talk had already started. But anyways, we should get going. Um, in fact, uh, this is a very good time to talk about proof of work and proof of stake make it, because just now Ethereum, which is the second biggest blockchain, of course, transferred from proof of work to proof of stake. And I hope that by the time that we're done with this talk, you will understand, in fact, why they had done it. So I just want to start uh, before, because this is a, a Columbia blockchain um, organized event, to say that the Algorand Foundation is given uh, 50 million in um, to, to support centers all over the world in leading universities. And Columbia is one of the places that got one of these grants. Um, the uh, purpose of these grants is really to encourage research, uh, education, and community outreach in the universities. And we really wanted to focus that it would be world round. And we had a competition, there were many applicants, and uh, we had a set of experts who chose them. And you can see here on the map, the huge distribution of where we have centers. And um, Columbia appears under the Yale. Uh, there is a lead university for each one of the centers, and Columbia is a sub of uh, Yale. And really, the emphasis is on education to try and get a new generation of um, people, developers, to be working. And the best place to find people, of course, at least in our mind, is in the universities. OK. So we're all here because we're interested in blockchains. And by the size of the crowd here, it's clear that everybody's just interested in the top layer, which are the currencies themselves and all the money and the apps involved in it. But the truth is that blockchains have a very interesting under the hood technologies. And um, I think sometimes it's good to know, even if you're only building on top, to understand what's coming from the bottom. And uh, so here I will talk about the cryptography which underlies these designs of blockchains. And I'm going to deal with a specific um, topic here in the talk today, which is how do we extend the blockchain? How are transactions added? So basically, it happens in, we can call it two or three steps, I don't know. A leader is elected, and it proves that it's the leader. It proposes a block, and then the block is agreed upon and added to the blockchain. So you see, we went from four to five. And today, I'm going to talk not about the um, proposing of the block, how a leader chooses the transactions that they put in the block, but on the most important outer layer, which is the leader election and the agreeing on the next block. Now, I said that I was going to describe the cryptography that's underneath the hood. And what's very interesting about blockchains, and in fact, what I love about them and about this technology, which is truly phenomenal, is that it drew on a lot of existing things that were created from the 80s. And we'll I'll mention these things when we go along and built new beautiful designs on top of them and created a whole new world. But these things have been around for a long time. And now the blockchain itself is introducing new problems into the research community, things that can be solved um, using the availability of a blockchain. And so really it's a, a synergetic system that it, it was designed on cryptography and it's giving back to cryptography and it's really amazing. And in fact, that's sort of the beauty always of research. 
So proof of work, just to show you how long ago it was invented, it was invented in 1992, not with the word, not with the name proof of work, the name was given a little bit later. And it was introduced by uh, Dwok and Naor because what they wanted to do was um, to fight spam. Spam was starting to be a big, big problem. You guys weren't even born, you don't know that. But um, it, it, people were thinking, how do we stop spammers? from? Because mailboxes were overflowing. And the idea was that people would need to work to expense uh, electricity, computing power, and so on, in order to be able to send messages. And this is where this idea originated. The interesting thing is that in 2002, Adam Back came up with the same idea. He didn't, he says he didn't know about the Dwork Nao result, and he reinvented this idea. And in fact, Nakamoto builds on Back. It, it also doesn't know about Dwork Nao, and it cites back for uh, the proof of work concept and creates um, Bitcoin. Okay, so what is the idea that um, Nakamoto has for choosing a leader? The leader that's gonna announce the next block, it basically says, we will put out a puzzle. Every time we need to extend the blockchain, we'll put a puzzle out. and. The person who solves the puzzle and can give a proof that they in fact solved the puzzle, that's gonna be our leader, okay? And these puzzles, you need to work in order to solve them. So you work until you solve the puzzle and then you announce your solution. So how did they create these puzzles? And these are puzzles that can be infinitely generated. There's no lack of puzzles. It's not that you put one puzzle out and that's it, you're done. You can continuously create puzzles. And the puzzle is built utilizing something which is called a hash function. A hash function is another cryptographic primitive which is used in many, many things, in digital signatures and in many applications. What does a hash function do? takes a very, very long string. And it basically creates, it, it funnels it through this machine and it creates a short string, okay? And this is very, very useful. And it's useful here in the case um, of the puzzles of the blockchain. So I said, there are many reasons to string mes messages, but I'm not gonna discuss them here. Here, I'm gonna go just to the question of the puzzle. Something that's true about this uh, hash function is that it's very easy to compute. It's very easy to go from a long string to a small string, but if I'm giving you some short string, it's very hard to go back and find something that would map to this thing. Okay, so what's the puzzle? What's the puzzle that Nakamoto proposed? It said, I'm giving you a string, and this string has a leading zero, okay? It's not a string, sorry, it's a number. It's a number, in my case, I put six digits here, and the top number has to be um, zero, which means that the number has to be 99999 or smaller, okay? They, these are all the numbers that I can write when I have a leading zero. And you have to find a message such that when you hash it, as I wrote at the bottom, H of MI, it will be such a number. The output will be a number smaller or equal to 999, 99,999. Okay, so this is the puzzle. And you can see that if I ask that there's only one leading zero, that the expectation is that you'd need to compute only on two messages to find such an answer to the puzzle. If you don't get the math completely of why that is true and you don't know about expectations or so on, don't worry about it, but just have the sense that if there's one leading zero, you need to run twice. Now I changed it to two leading zeros. Now 
you're going to need to try four times in order to find something that hashes to something with two leading zeros, okay? And the idea is that the more leading zeros that you have, the harder that the puzzle is, okay? So what Nakamoto did is it enabled to have a variable length puzzle. At the beginning, the goal is that a block will be announced every 10 minutes. That is something that the um, uh, Bitcoin blockchain wants to have. Every 10 minutes, a block is announced. So what Nakamoto did is that the puzzles are variable in their complexity. If there aren't a lot of miners, not a lot of people are doing the work, then the puzzles need to be easier because until you find a solution, it's going to take longer. So you put fewer zeros at the beginning. If everybody's mining, then you want the puzzle to be very difficult. You put many zeros at the beginning. So these were the puzzles that Nakamoto introduced. And they have this variability in order to satisfy this thing that it would always take 10 minutes um, to mine a block. OK, I'll skip this. OK. So as I said, it takes 10 minutes to choose the leader, OK? But that's not enough, right? There, if we choose the leader, it could be that we chose two leaders and we might have a fork in the blockchain. Two people solve the puzzle and announce their block. So the way that the, the Bitcoin blockchain works is that you always go with the longer chain. And the way that this is determined and sort of that agreement is reached is simply by waiting. There is no algorithm that allows people to reach consensus on which one is the correct block that we're going to be continuing with. So basically, in Bitcoin, what you do is you run and sort of you always go with the longest chain. So if your block is already five blocks deep, one you're interested in, you assume that this is already going to remain the block in the blockchain and that there will not be a fork. Okay, so who are, who's doing this work on uh, behalf of uh, the Bitcoin blockchain? These are the miners. And um, we know that there are uh, many, many miners out there and they're rewarded for their efforts. This is part of the Bitcoin design until the Bitcoins, the initial Bitcoins will be exhausted, at which point there will, um, the only um, incentive that the miners will have is from the fees that are going to be put inside the transactions. Those will probably have to rise to compensate uh, and uh, still entice miners um, to do the mining. These miners, they're um, very big mining farms, and many of them have invested in dedicated hardware which basically means that joining um, the mining on uh, Bitcoin is today very, very expensive. If you want to become a miner that can actually get rewards, it's going to be challenging. Okay. And what are the desired properties that we want from any blockchain, not just the Bitcoin one, is that it won't fork. As I said, Bitcoin can and has forked, um, but there hopefully is some solution for these things. That blocks are continuously added. You don't want the blockchain to stall. That is that at some point, for some reason, blocks cannot be added. And we want all these things to happen, even if there are bad um, parties in this ecosystem, even if people are trying really to fork the blockchain or to stall it and so on, you really want things to be able to continue. But now we get to the issue of what's the issue with proof of work, okay? And I do want to say that I'll, the design and the thought that went into it is really amazing. It should not be knocked down just because um, what I'm going to say now, it should not counter that. But 
I do want to say that to make clear that the algorithms are beautiful. However, the proof of work is very intensive in consumption of electricity. This is some quote, you can go online, you can find all kinds of um, statements of how much um, electricity it costs. But here it says, uh, the electricity to mine one Bitcoin using the most efficient hardware available is nine years of an average household, okay? This really is extremely expensive. And as a result, um, people looked at alternatives and wanted to design blockchains that would be better for the environment. And proof of stake is that alternative. It really is a green option compared to what's going on with Bitcoin. So let's remember what we want to solve and see how we're going to do it in the um, proof of stake world. We want to elect a leader. The leader is going to propose a block. And then we're going to agree uh, on the block that is added to the blockchain. And here again, the designers of proof of stake protocols went into the cryptographic arsenal and all of the solutions which we had previously from years before and utilized them again in order to design protocols that are proof of stake and would give us uh, a blockchain. And just to, to state a few things, I didn't really even state anything. And I'm stating here things that relate to the Algorand blockchain, because that's the one I'm going to be describing. But there are other techniques and other blockchains utilize other things as well. So of course, digital signatures. Digital signatures also are utilized in the Bitcoin blockchain, of course, to sign transactions. We're going to use protocols that are called randomized Byzantine agreement. These are basically protocols to reach consensus in order to agree on which block is going to be added. And the Algorand blockchain uses something which is called the verifiable random function. And I want to say that when the verifier, verifiable random functions or VRFs were introduced, it wasn't even clear what they'd be utilized for. They were a beautiful, beautiful idea as many of the cryptographic designs are. And like many things in research, sometimes you come up with an idea and you give a solution to this problem and it's completely theoretical and it isn't clear why we need it or, why, or what we're gonna do with it. But then eventually things do come up and suddenly there are uh, technologies that need these kinds of uh, protocols. Um, so what is the idea behind proof of stake? In a proof of work, you can just come, you can buy the software, you don't buy the, so uh, the hardware, you don't buy it, you just utilize software, and you just sit in mind and you compute, compute until you solve the problem. Here, in order to choose the leader, the leader is going to be chosen in proportion to their stake in the blockchain. So if there are 100 tokens on the blockchain and you have 30, like the guy here on your right, this guy is going to be chosen 30% of the time to be the leader and so on and so forth. So your stake basically represents um, the fraction of time that you're going to be chosen in, as a leader. And I want to say something very important about proof of stake. I said that it's going to be green, of course, which is important. But there's something beyond that. In proof of stake, the incentives are more aligned um, with the blockchain than in proof of work. If you're in a proof of work, you may be a type of person who mines and immediately sells your Bitcoins or your ETH. And you immediately send it because you're really not interested in the blockchain itself. You're looking at this as a job and 
you're doing it and then you get paid, you get your salary. But in proof of stake, you're a hundred percent connected to this blockchain. If you own 30% of the blockchain, that's really a lot. We, we, we don't hope that these would be the numbers. But even if you own 1% or 2%, this is an investment of yours which you care about. So you do care about the blockchain and it continuing to produce blocks and staying alive and uh, not forking and so on. All these things, you truly care about them because your money is inside this blockchain. So I think that proof of stake, beyond being green, of course, it really is more suited um, in, as I keep on saying, in aligning your interests and your actions. Okay. So as I said, I'm going to talk about the Algorand proof of stake. There are many proof of stake um, blockchains out there. They all do um, different protocols to some extent, but um, the, the ideas and the principles are somewhat the same. But I'm talking about the Algorand blockchain uh, proof of stake because this solution technically is really outstanding. It was designed by Silvio Micali. I don't know if you guys know who he is, but he's a Turing Award winner. He's the inventor of uh, zero knowledge, which is used in many, many blockchains. And uh, this is another one of his um, uh, brainchild, children, child, I don't know. And he really is outstanding and the design is um, mind blowing. Okay. So what do we do in this uh, proof of stake? We basically think about it as a lottery. You have all these people that have tokens and basically they're gonna be pulling out of a hat balls that have numbers on them. And the person who pulls out the ball with the smallest number, that person is gonna become the leader. Okay, so this person put 64, 40, seven and 44. And you see that the guy with the seven had the smallest number and it's gonna be chosen as, as the leader. This is the leader and they're gonna propose the block. So you might say that we're done because we chose the leader, but the same way as in the Bitcoin case, it wasn't sufficient that you solved the puzzle. There could still be two people who solved the puzzle. So you really need to agree on the block that the leader proposed. And um, here we are going to be actively making a decision, unlike the situation in Bitcoin. We're going to be deciding to agree on which um, uh, is this on which block we're going to be adding. And what are we going to be doing? We're going to be utilizing Byzantine agreement. Byzantine agreement is a problem which was introduced in the 80s in distributed computing. And basically, I think it's more commonly known in our uh, blockchain world as consensus. But basically, you're going to reach consensus on this block. And actively making this decision instead of waiting 40 minutes reduces the time that you need in order to agree on the block. In fact, the Algorand blockchain reaches agreement within five seconds. So think about it. If you're gonna be going and buying coffee at Starbucks and they're not, and you, you order your cup and then you pay with Bitcoin and now they tell you 40 minutes, you know, you're not gonna be so hot about that hot coffee. And uh, here, when it's five seconds, this makes this completely relevant for a use in, in real life systems. It's like, it's almost like your credit card, right? They swipe your card, that surely takes five, five seconds. So actively deciding on the block and not just waiting for agreement by time elapsing uh, gives you a lot of power. And also it completely, um, or almost completely eliminates the possibility of a fork, which does exist in the um, 
proof of work Bitcoin world. Okay. So here, um, I'm just giving you sort of a, a, a comparison. In Bitcoin, it takes 10 minutes um, to agree on the block, uh, sorry, to choose the leader and to agree on the block. In Algorand, it's five seconds. However, here, in fact, I didn't write it. I forgot. It's 10 minutes plus the 40 minute wait. I was editing the slide and somehow forgot. So you can see the huge difference between these two things. So just to summarize, what are the differences? And here, the, call, the talk, I called it proof of work and proof of stake. But the truth is that versus is more appropriate because you really need to compare these things when you're examining blockchains and which blockchains you want to work on and uh, build your products. And I think that in this day and age, the fact that there are blockchains which are green compared to blockchains with, which aren't is very, very critical. The agreement gives you increased throughput, things move much faster and there's low latency. If you use a BA to agree on the block, and this is, depends on which um, uh, proof of stake blockchain you're using, then you will also eliminate the forking and um, the incentives are much more aligned and appropriate for this setting. Thank you. I don't know if we have time for a question, but if there is a question, of, or, yes. Exactly, that you can um, uh, put out a block every five seconds. I didn't go into, let's say an Algorand, the computation to choose, a, a, to, um, a, choose the leader is like, one exponentiation, that's like a digital signature. Your phone does these all, all the time. And uh, the Byzantine agreement protocol, it's how much can you compute in five seconds? Not a lot. Huge, huge. And uh, I mean, let's not ignore the fact that Ethereum was completely um, uh, aware. I mean, everybody is aware, but even took the massive step to go from proof of work to, to proof of stake. Yes. Yes. Sure. So first of all, as I said, we have this ACE program, which is a 50 million program, which has been given out to universities. But in order to be part of that program, you have to be part of a university. It's not something that you can get um, uh, directly as an individual. In addition, we have a lot of uh, grants. And um, we have slightly moved from a grant model where you can apply for grants and we give them out to things that we seek out and we give out um, uh, requests for people to implement and so on. But that's uh, another aspect of our supporting things. Yes. So in fact, it's not the case. So this is something which I didn't touch upon, but in fact, um, in most blockchains, I don't wanna say all because I don't know all designs, but the leader does not speak until they announce the block. So there is no way to attack the person who's the leader um, a, because the minute that they speak and you know who they are, they've already announced their block. So no, yes. Yes, sure. The participation nodes are the nodes that participate in the Byzantine agreement. They are the ones that um, uh, um, propose themselves as leaders and then do the protocol for the Byzantine agreement. But the Byzantine agreement and the leader election, I mean, you have to announce who you are. These are, this is a protocol that requires communication. And for that, there are the relay nodes and the relay nodes are the ones that transfer the messages between um, the 
participation notes. So it's a two-layer thing. You need uh, less trust in the relay notes. Of course, we want the messages transferred, but they are not part of the protocol. They're not doing the computation. Okay. Yes. I'm sure that there are people that care about this deeply and would only, let's say, do applications on green blockchains. Though it's hard to say, right, because Ethereum is the most utilized blockchain up to now. I hope that things, uh, now that it's greener, will be better. I think that um, definitely there are people that it's important to them and it will matter. I don't know if it'll accept tolerate things, but definitely I think it's important. Okay, yes. There is. Listen, I think that definitely what's driving the blockchains is the applications on top of them. This is a huge thing. But I definitely think that there is room for more inno innovative cryptography um, to try and reach new types of blockchains and to do new things um, uh, that currently don't exist. That's what I said when I said that I think it's circular, that the blockchain world is now feeding very new interesting questions into the cryptography world, and I think that those will circulate back in. But I'm a cryptographer, so. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>